and welcome to this episode of HBCU. I'm your host, D. Brown, CEO. Joining me today is a powerful panel of women who made their way here from various HBCUs. To my right, we have Lori Chastain, a commander in the U.S. Navy, who joined us by way of Spelman University in Atlanta, Georgia. Next to, to Lori is Dr. Kristen Brody, who, who had the distinct honor of, of actually graduating from two rivalry institutions, she received her undergraduate at Alcorn State University and her master's and PhD from the Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. And joining me on remote is Monica Barnes, who made her way here from the Jackson State University where she earned a master's degree as well. Ladies, welcome to HBCU. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start by just letting my viewers know who you are and what you do. So, Lori, I'll start with you. Okay, uh, yeah. my name is Commander Lori Chesting. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a commander in the United States Navy and I currently work at the Pentagon. Dr. Brody. Kristen Brody, I am the director of the Economic Mobility Project at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, senior economist and economic advisor, and I'm also a lecturer at Spelman. Great, Monica. I am Monica Barnes, straight out of Jackson, Mississippi, and I am the executive producer of the Steve Harvey Morning Show. I started at the University of Southern Mississippi, but I got my master's at the Jackson State University in counseling and rehabilitative services. And I did uh, mental health. I was a mental health practitioner for 12 years prior to switching to radio. Great. So, ladies, you all have an amazing story. Uh, you, you all have done a lot to really highlight the success that HBCUs um, are having around the country. But I want to start by, by understanding how did you migrate to your HBCU? So, Lori, I'm going to start with you. How did you end up at Spelman? Well, I, I ended up at Spelman College um, kind of by accident. Uh, it was not my first choice. Uh, my first choice was a PWI. Um, that's kind of the, the area where I had grown up. Um, I got a phone call from this PWI, and uh, they informed me, well, they asked me how it felt to be uh, African-American and attend, get selected to go to this institution. Um, in that moment, I realized that all of my accomplishments, everything that I had done, um, had been reduced to the color of my skin. And uh, I went back and I started looking at all the different brochures that you get from the different colleges and universities. And it says, this is who we are and this is what we do. And this is where all the black students hang out. So I went and I cried. And my dad said, Lori, your cousin went to Spelman College. I'm gonna take you to Spelman College. And he took me to Spelman College, you know. <laughs> and the rest is history. Now, now Dr. Brody, uh as I stated in the opening, you have the distinct honor of being on both sides of one of the biggest rivalries in the state of Mississippi. And so I want to understand how did you, one, migrate to Alcorn State University, and then what led to the transition over to the wild side of the Jackson State University? So I, I attended Ag Hope when I was 16. It was a, a summer program and I fell in love with Alcorn. And Dr. Clinton Bristow, who had been a friend of the family, told a lot of us that if you went to Alcorn and majored in agriculture, you would always have a job because people had to eat. Now, when Dr. Stallings told us that we were gonna have to take a chicken <laughs> from running around to putting it on a plate, I changed my major to <laughs> criminal justice that very same day. <laughs> Um, but, but at the time, Jackson State's MBA program was AACSB accredited. Alcorn's is now, but that kind of made the difference for me in terms of the master's. And I knew I also wanted to get a PhD. Got you. So, Monica, now you started off at Southern University, which is a PWI in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, correct? Mm -hmm. And then for your master's, you went to uh, the Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. Talk to me about that selection to, to attend Jackson State. 
Well, I grew up in Jackson, so I grew up going to football games with my parents, getting the binoculars, watching the J-sets on the field, and just listening to the sonic boom of the South. And I knew I always wanted to go back and get a degree, an advanced degree from Jackson State. My brother went to Jackson State. My father um, got his uh, MBA at Jackson State, and I would go to classes with him back in the day when you could take your kids to school. So I always had the Tiger pride in me. I just had to get back and get that MS degree. Um, and it was it was a no brainer. I was at back in home um, after graduation, after graduating from USM, I said, it's time. So I went, I got a um, grant sponsored tuition waiver and um, book uh, voucher. So I basically went to school at Jackson State, uh, one of the best experiences of my life. And I would, you wouldn't change it for anything in the world. So, you know, every HBCU has uh, its distinct characteristics. And so, Lori, I want to know from you that when you arrived on the campus of Spelman College, what was it like? Oh, my goodness. It was it was a dream. I felt like I had come home. Um, I tell a story and, and I think to a lot of people it sounds a little cliche. Right. So here we are driving up to Spelman College and I jump out. And this young lady runs up to me and she has Afro puffs and that supports the story. And she says, welcome my sister. And she gave me a hug. Now, why Afro puffs is important. Um, growing up where I grew up, it was not OK for someone like me to have Afro puffs. So I had not seen that since I was a child. And when I was a child, I was made fun of. You know, everybody wanted to touch my hair. Um, so to step on that campus and to see this heaven of beautiful black women where we could be ourselves, I knew I had landed at the right school. Wow. So, Dr. Brody, first of all, before you talk about that, when, when you go to the Soul Bowl, Alcorn versus Jackson State, who you rooting for? Who you got? So I'll tell you that this this last game, I sat in the box on Jackson State side because I was the commencement speaker. So I was invited to sit in the box. But now I did root for Alcorn. Did you? OK. I, I had on some Air Jordans. I had <laughs> one that was blue and white and one that was purple and gold. And the president laughed at me. But but <laughs> I have to say I sat in the box on Jackson State side at this last game. So talk to me about your early days at Alcorn State University, when you when you made it to the um, the reservation. The, so the edu- we don't call, call it the, the reservation the educational, anymore. The education resort, what, what do you call it now? The academic <laughs> the resort. The academic resort. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so talk to me about the academic resort. So I remember getting there um, and studying beneath the shade of giant trees, fanned by a balmy southern breeze, where the air is just a little bit cleaner and sweeter, and the water is just a little bit clearer. And it was the most amazing experience that I've ever had in my life. So who have the best homecoming? Spellman. So, so <laughs> that, that's, that's an easy one Jackson because State. I've never been to homecoming at Jackson State. So I, I can't say better or worse, but for homecoming, I do go to Alcorn. Okay, okay. So, so Monica, we're gonna allow you to weigh in because you had the, uh, the experience of attending a PWI and then going on to uh, Jackson State University and HBCU. So talk to me about, number one, the differences in the two cultures, and then what it was like to be at Jackson State University. Well, the culture was a lot different for me because at the PWI, of course, they're more advanced. You register by phone. You don't have to go to financial aid. And that was the first shocker, getting on Jackson State's (laughs) campus. But (laughs) but we passed that. We got past it. But just the camaraderie, just being on the campus, because I pledged Delta at uh, the PWI. And when I got on campus and I saw the Delta tree and all the fraternities on the yard, and it was just I was home, like Lori said, I was home. I felt where, like I belonged there. The fashions alone, I was like, oh, I got to get some clothes to go to school here because from PWI to HBCU is a totally different fashion world. So I, I definitely had to step my fashion game up and going to class. Um, it just felt good. The classes were smaller, uh, more intense. I got that one-on-one that I didn't get at the PWI. And I just, it, I really enjoyed learning from instructors that look like me and that had the same um, past as I did. And just culturally, 
tuned into what I was going through. It was just a lot different. What were the, what were the homecomings like at Jackson State University? Oh my goodness! From the time I could walk, I just remember the da na 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 na. It's not no comparison. Nobody has the boom. Nobody has the Prince J sets. Beyonce even took our little moves. So you know, it's like <laughs> we're trendsetters. We are HBCU. So you know, it's the. So Laura, what, what was homecoming like at Spelman? Oh my goodness! It was. So our homecoming, it's so interesting because, um, as you're aware, there's Spelman, there's Morehouse, there's Clark Atlanta, and there's also Morris Brown. Um, and so Spelman and Morehouse always have their homecomings together. Um, and uh, usually Clark Atlanta would come in and then also Morris Brown. Um, the homecoming I remember the most was uh, one year I was, on, I was on one of the sub courts. I wasn't on the big court. I was one of the dorm queens. And we're going through the parade. And I'm on my car and I'm doing all of this. And I'm like, hey mom, hey grandma. And then I went, hey, uh, what are you doing here? It was one of my cousins. And um, Cherry Faye. And she said, Sean is right behind you. And I went, what? Sean, Sharon, she is a cousin of mine. She was also on a homecoming court for Morris Brown. Okay. So we're both in the parade, waving at each other. And I thought, this is Awesome. The Gardner girls have it going on. Um, but it was amazing. And, and to see all of those schools come together, it's, it's unlike anything in the world. So, Monica, talk to me about uh, what you do as the executive producer of the Steve Harvey Morning Show and kind of what that whole career is like. Um, basically, I am the talent booker as well. So I make sure all the interviews get booked. I do the talking points. Uh, talk, converse with the publicists and that kind of thing. Anything that's going on, I make sure it gets into copy. Um, I do write show copy for the team so they'll know what's going on because my boss is very busy, so he doesn't get to be up on pop culture and what's going on in TV and what we're watching on Netflix this week. So I pull in public interest stories, uh, entertainment news and that kind of thing. So they have show content. And then I also work with sales to do the ads for the show. Um, the I work as a liaison with the sales team, with iHeart and other agencies that want to spend money on the show. So it's a never ending job. And we do uh, the show is from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., 3 to 7 when I'm on L in L.A. So it's 3 in the morning to 7 in the morning. So it's like I said, once the show has wrapped, I'm fielding emails, calls, booking talent and um, having conference calls for promotions and that kind of thing. So it's pretty fun and, and involved. So, and then we travel a lot too. We do live broadcasts in different cities and um, we just went to Dubai and we work from Dubai. So the power of technology, it's beautiful where you can do radio from anywhere now. So what is it like working with Steve Harvey? Oh my goodness, it's a never ending, <laughs> <laughs> it's never a dull moment. And I always say, I'm glad that I have my mental health background because <laughs> definitely need it. You know, some people don't know that they, you know, they need a diagnosis and we banter about it all the time. And he'll say, you don't tell me what to do. And I think I've last, lasted so long with him, it's been 14 years because he does appreciate the pushback. And when he's, you know, saying, you know, someone says, no, you can't do that, sir. Let's do it like this. You can't do it like that. He does appreciate the voice of reason, but he does like to bristle up first and say, you don't tell me. And I'm like, <laughs> well, can we do it? You know, right. so it's, a, it's, it's finessing. It's a lot of finessing when you work with a king of comedy. So and then I have six other to five other talents that I also have to work with. It's four comedians total on the show and two ladies who are just a joy and a breeze to work with compared to the guys. So. Wow. Sound like fun. So, Dr. Brody, um, talk to me about being an economist. What do you uh, do on a daily basis? So I'm, I'm the director of the Economic Mobility Project at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And so one of my big jobs is to promote the research of fellow economists at the Fed. Um, so we're organizing an event right now, which will be on April the 7th, on what is inclusive full employment. So one of my jobs is to not just promote the research to other economists, but to also share it with the public um, and with people who can really make a difference, public policy people, community members, and just sharing, you know, what is fiscal policy? What is monetary policy? policy what is inflation? Like it, explaining all of those things and trying to share it in a way such that policymakers can make a difference in our communities. 
Lori, you are currently stationed at the Pentagon, and I know you've mm -hmm. had a number of different roles um, within the Navy, and you've come up the ranks to become a commander. Uh, but I, I want you to, before we talk about your current role at the Pentagon, which we'll get to, uh, talk to me about you uh, operating nuclear reactors. Wow, that was um, a huge experience, a huge opportunity. Um, so I was 26 years old, and I was stationed on board USS Enterprise. Um, she is the first and the fastest nuclear aircraft carrier in the United States Navy. Um, she has since been decommissioned, but she was the only one in her class. So she had eight reactors. Um, and uh, at the time, I had, there were two reactors per plant. So I was uh, the reactor controls division officer for number two and three plants. So I had four of her reactors. Um, and I was directly responsible for doing all of the calculations um, when we would shut down a reactor, you know, we're trying to bring it back up, making sure that we had cal calibrated everything correctly. Um, because in a business like nuclear power, where it's all based on exponents, right, the difference between a decimal, you know, that's, you want to make sure that that's in the right place so we can maintain um, accuracy and, and proper operation of those reactors. So now you're at the Pentagon. Yeah. So talk to me about what you do there. So currently at the Pentagon, I am the deputy director um, of what we call our performance uh, to plan team. Um, it's very interesting in that it is, uh, it's very unique. So myself and my direct boss, um, we are the only military members of that team. We have a group of government contractors. Uh, and what we do is we go in and we look for inefficiencies um, in how the Navy writ large operates. So we're looking to pull these different levers so we operate more efficiently um, and make changes to uh, our operations and hopefully help out our budget um, while we're doing that. So all of you being uh, ladies that are performing at a really high level, I'm sure all of you all have run into uh, obstacles and challenges along the way. So talk to me a little bit, Monica, about diversity, equity, and inclusion and your stance on that and some of the challenges you've had in your career. Well, working for a nationally syndicated radio show, there aren't many people that look like me and there are very few. Well, I, I think it's like two or three females that do this on a syndicated level. So um, that in itself with the equal pay and that kind of thing, it's constantly a struggle. And you know that your counterparts are doing a little better than you financially, but you still, you know, push forward, move forward and you get your little annual increase. And you're like, OK. You know, and then you say, well, I need this to move to L.A. And then they say, OK, we'll give you this. We'll give you that. So that's a constant struggle with the finance, financial end of it. And then, too, even to enter the room with men. And I was once told, oh, so you got both of your degrees in Mississippi, you know, because we're, we're seen as subpar in education and other things. So that struggle in itself. And then, as you can hear, I have a very southern drawl. I left Mississippi in 96. I've lived in Dallas, Chicago, Atlanta, L.A., and it's still with me and I'm proud of it. So, you know, I've been told, oh, you speak so slowly or, you know, you don't sound educated. And, and that irks me because it's by men with lesser intelligence than me, lesser degree, you know, right. just high school diploma. So just a constant struggle to be proven. I mean, to prove your worth and that you deserve a seat at the table. And it, it, it gets frustrating. But, you know, just do it with grace. Stay poised, stay professional, and I just kill them with kindness, you know, and it's like, oh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, this is who I am, and, you know, I'm here. Right, right. <laughs> so. so, Dr. Brody, uh, you know, obviously uh, in your position, I'm sure you've had your share of challenges and stereotypes, et cetera. So talk to me about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion and some of the challenges you've had. So for much of my career, I taught at HBCUs. I started out at Benedict College in South Carolina. I've also taught at Atlanta Metro, um, Fort Valley State University, Kentucky State University, Howard. Um, I taught in, in China for a summer. Um, and, and from there, I went on to the Brookings Institution and from there to the Chicago Fed where I am now. Um, and I guess I really haven't experienced racism as much, but homophobia, um, I, I really couldn't come out until I got tenure. It just wasn't comfortable, right? Yeah. Because many HBCUs have um, some sort of LGBT club or acceptance for students, and they say they do for faculty, but not so much. And so it's like you have to be careful um, at, at some places, not all, and I'm not naming any names, 
But at some places you have to be careful um, being who you are before you get tenure. Yeah. And so once I got tenure the first time at 38, um, that was it for me. Like I, I decided to just be who I was. But that was that was my biggest issue. There aren't many black female economists. Right. Um, but surprisingly, I really haven't experienced racism in the white spaces that I've worked. And I'm really happy with the Chicago Fed, the fact that they have an economic mobility project, that they are promoting the research that they're promoting, and that I feel very at home and very accepted there. So. That's great. We all deserve to uh, be in a um, inclusive uh, workspace, workplace. So, Lori, uh, being a commander in the military, you know, obviously a, an area that's dominated by men, and then also uh, being a black uh, female on top of that, what have been the challenges that you faced? Oh, gosh, representation, absolutely, um, especially in the nuclear field. Um, the, I liken my life to the movie um, Hidden Figures because for the first time I felt represented. I know what it feels like to be in that room and everyone you're smarter than everyone in the room, but nobody listens to you because you're black and a female. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did, I, at one point I did something about it. Um, I was a recruiter down in Millington and uh, they had all kinds of pictures and brochures of people in the Navy and nuclear engineers in the Navy and none of them looked like me. So I walked across the hall to the office and I asked the question, why are there no black people on these brochures. And the response was, we don't have a market for black people in the nuclear Navy. And I said, well, you make one. And I did not know it was gonna happen, but upper leadership, they listened. I think they realized that, you know, we were missing out on a huge part of the population with that thought process. And uh, they took some pictures, and now if you go to a recruit station, that's me on there. So that's how you ended up on the poster for the Navy? Yes, yes. Wow. Well, they have an old saying, a closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? So we have to speak exactly. up. Exactly. So we know that there are a number of challenges uh, facing HBCUs. Uh, and we, I think one that's been highlighted in recent news has been just really the lack of uh, attention from, NF, from the NFL and recruiting African-American uh, football players from HBCUs. And so Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, has made a, a really big stance and tr he's trying to make a, a, a difference and, and rewrite the narrative there. What do you think are some of the issues uh, that HBCUs are facing that is, that's causing organizations like the NFL not to give serious attention uh, to people that are just as qualified? And so Monica, I'll start with you. I, I don't think they see us. I think the perception that um, we're subpar in education and, and talent and other things, and then our athletic programs aren't as flashy as the other, uh, other um, what do you call it? The, um, the PW, SEC. PWIs and yeah, those. institutions. institutions. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And with uh, Dion, Coach Prime, as for example, coming in from a Florida State background in college, he took all the things that he got in college and now he's implementing them at an HBCU. And it was a shocker for him to even know that they didn't have the basic things that, you know, the PWIs had. So he is like forcing change and forcing it across the board. And the other coaches are following suit now because he's basically trying to say, why aren't we getting this? Why aren't the cameras on us? So he took it upon himself to do a documentary and put it out there himself to see so they can see here we are, this is what we're doing. Our boys are great. He's gotten them in suits and they're they're polished now. So and it's all it's, it's it's sad that we have to show up, show out to show up, but that's basically what we have to do to show them here we are, we're great. You know, you're using our players anyway. They're just coming from PWIs. It's us, you know, let's put this back into our own schools and get the attention over here, get the cameras over here. So now we're on ESPN, we're on ESPN two. And we're having bowl games. We're in Miami. We're going to this state and that state. We're not just pigeonholed into between Valley and Alcorn and, and Jackson State's uh, campus, which we don't even have our own stadium. Right. You know, that's unheard of for an HB, for a, a school of its caliber. We are over, off, uh, you know, at Mississippi Memorial Stadium, which they named 
the Tiger Stadium, but it's not ours. We need something right. on our campus. So when the cameras do come, they see the Urban University, which is Jackson State, sitting in the middle of the city, you know, who that it looks great now. And they're actually cleaning up the image of the HBCUs, which is great. So we we look good on camera now. No, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> and I think that it's going to take uh, an organized effort, you know, from people like Coach Prime as well as others to continue to push the envelope to try to get that attention that's needed so that not only get the attention and get, uh, you know, employment opportunities, but also to get equal funding to be, to be able to, to compete from standpoint of facilities and infrastructure and those things that uh, PWIs tend to have uh, in a much more abundance. Uh, we're about to wrap up this episode of uh, HBCU, but when we come back to the part two of this, of this segment, uh, we're gonna let Dr. Brody and, and uh, Lori weigh in on this same subject. And so um, this, this is uh, pretty much it for this episode. I appreciate the viewers for watching. And remember, without you, there's no me.